Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm an alcoholic and addict in recovery. And today I want to talk a little bit about the incurable, progressive, and fatal nature of addiction as it's discussed in the book Living Sober, which was put out by Alcoholics Anonymous World Services in 1975. Reading a little bit from the book, they say, Many people in the world know they cannot eat certain foods, oysters, strawberries, eggs, or cucumbers, or sugar, or something else, without getting an uncomfortable feeling and maybe even getting quite sick. A person with a food allergy of this kind can go around feeling a lot of self-pity, complaining to everyone that he or she is unfairly deprived, and constantly whining about not being able or allowed to eat something delicious. Obviously, even though we may feel cheated, it isn't wise to ignore our own physiological makeup. If our limitations are ignored, severe discomfort or illness may result. To stay healthy and ha reasonably happy, we must learn to live with the bodies we have. One of the new thinking habits a recovering alcoholic can develop is a calm view of him or herself as someone who needs to avoid chemicals, alcohol, and other drugs that are substitutes for it, if he or she wants to maintain good health. So one of the things that I struggled with personally was the when I was in my addiction and flirting with the idea that maybe I was uh, having problems with alcohol and drugs and maybe I needed to like not touch them for the rest of my life in order to get better. When I was first flirting with that idea, it really bothered me that I might have to give these things up forever, that I might not be able to partake in any alcohol ever, may not be able to make a toast without a, without a bottle of beer or a glass of wine, you know, wouldn't be able to pass the joint around at a, at a party. Um, these things really, really bothered me. And an important part of recovery is acceptance and acceptance of our own condition. And you can argue all you want about whether or not it's fair, but we, we really shouldn't get caught up in what's fair. The fact is that some of us are physiologically predisposed to addiction. Uh, it's, it is the disease model of addiction works. And the more we find out about the way the brain of addicts differs from the brain of normal people, the, the more that this model fits addiction. And the fact is that people who have a predisposition to addiction can never safely return to drug or alcohol use. So as an addict, I have given up the idea that I will somehow learn how to drink normally and drink responsibly. I've given up the idea that I will return to a state where I can have one beer and be fine with it. And the use, me using the words return to that state, are, are that's not correct because I was never able to do that in the first place. So it's not even returning to that state. It's finding a way to that state. And I will never be able to do that. Accepting that, then I have a choice. I can wallow in my self-pity and be all upset about it, or I can go on living happily and actually find new joy in life because now I recognize something that's been dragging me down, something that's been causing problems for me, for my loved ones, and I can do something about it. So uh, let's read a little bit more from the book. Um, I want to touch on this next paragraph where they talk about how there is a lot of us who are coming from a place of addiction went through periods where it seemed like maybe we had control. So reading from the book, they say, oh, of course, many of us had periods for some months or even years. We sometimes thought that drinking had sort of straightened itself out. We seemed to be able to maintain a pretty heavy alcohol intake safely, or we would stay sober except for occasional drunk nights, and the drinking was not getting noticeably worse as far as we could see. 
nothing horrible or dramatic happened. However, we can now see that in the long or short haul, our drinking problem inevitably got more serious. So this is a perfect description for what happened to me. In my early 30s, I started drinking very heavily um, and really, really in an unsafe manner um, and uh, was drinking all the time. And when I probably, or 32, 33, I, I realized it was not appropriate what I was doing and I stopped. Um, I didn't stop drinking, but I stopped drinking as heavily as I was. And that lasted for a while. I was able to keep things under control for a while, but eventually found myself back to not only the place where I was in my early 30s, where I, I was drinking all the time, but even in a worse place. And I, I was feeling worse. I, was, I, I had worse mental problems as a result of it. Um, problems at work because of it and so the disease progresses and you know there are times where it seems like we have things under control and those times are dangerous because they make us think that we we've got this taken care of we're we're you know we're past the stage where alcohol or drugs are going to cause a big problem for us but in reality and uh, in in truth what people see is a, a return to that behavior as the disease progresses so um reading on a little bit more um you know as far as accepting one of the things that they say is we cannot change our body chemistry back to being the normal moderate social drinkers lots of us seem to be in our youth and I would invite anybody, look back at what you did in your youth. I mean, I can look back at the normal social drinking that I did in my youth, and I can see that I drank differently from the people around me. It may have been subtle, and it may the drinking may have looked the same from the outside, but the way I treated alcohol was different than they did. The way I treated drugs was different the, than they did. And the way I acted when those things were not available to me was different than they did. So looking back, can I can see some differences already developing in that period of time where I was just socially using. As some of us put it, we can no more make a change back to normal drinking then a pickle can change itself back into a cucumber. Um, and so, you know, once you got a pickle, you can't get it back to a cucumber. That makes sense. Um, so faced with this fact that we've got this incurable, progressive, fatal disease, what do you do when you learn you have an incurable, progressive, fatal disease, whether it's alcoholism or something else like heart condition or cancer? Many people just deny it is true, ignore the condition, accept no treatment for it, suffer, and die. So that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is accept it and move into the treatment phase. And so that's what I was able to do. I was convinced that a life for so many years, convinced that a life without alcohol, a life without drugs, would be an unhappy life that I would not be able to get the most out of life without those things. I was convinced that if I couldn't get high or couldn't get drunk, that life was not worth living. That's how much the disease had me in its grips. I was convinced that if you took these things out of my life, my life was worth less. And in fact, that my life was worthless. That's a terrible place to be, and addiction put me there. So getting into a treatment program, getting into a program of spiritual growth, which for me is AA, um, and uh, starting a spiritual journey taught me that that's not true, that it, actually my life kind of gets to start 
when I get rid of the drugs and alcohol and when I start a program of recovery. And uh, there's a quote in this section where a woman talks about um, her newfound joy in life uh, as, as a member of AA. And she says, who has time to feel deprived or self-pitying when you find there are so many delights connected with living unhappily? Uh, sorry. When you find there are so many de delights connected with living happily, unafraid of your illness. And I can tell you, if you are struggling with the idea of giving up alcohol or drugs, if you know you need to, but you're struggling with that idea, let me tell you, the freedom that you find in recovery and the, the joy that that allows you to feel as, as soon as you get a taste of that, it's better than any drug or any booze you've ever had in your life. And I can tell you that the feelings of joy I've had in recovery outshine any of the chemically induced emotions and feelings that I had in my addiction. And the times that I've been sad or felt depressed or angry in recovery have been minuscule compared to those negative emotions and the way those negative emotions express themselves in my addiction. It's better on the other side. And while it seems like you are giving up something by quitting drinking or quitting drugs, you get so much more when you start this physical, this spiritual journey into recovery. So I want to encourage anyone struggling with that idea, keep looking um, and, and keep talking to people and keep finding out that the things that you thought were giving you so much in life were actually really taking way more away. And once you let them go, the freedom and joy that you get to experience in recovery is better than anything addiction could have ever brought to you. Hope you all have a great day. I'll be back here tomorrow with more. Talk to you then.